the first talk last evening, I talked about uh, all the reasons that people give for leaving the church or maybe not joining the church or all the criticisms of the church. Um, uh, quite often people have legitimate complaints. Uh, they really do. People leave for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes they, they, they have reasons. They're upset. They're angry. I remember someone one time said, I, I left because the priest never visited my dying mother. Uh, that has happened. Uh, of course, the priest had 200 other dying people to visit that day. And, and, uh, but, you know, I understand the person being upset under those circumstances. Any number of things. Uh, don't ever give someone that much power over you that that could drive you out of the church. Why, why would you ever give another human being enough power over you to separate you from your faith? That doesn't make any sense. So yeah, there are all kind of reasons people leave the church, but there aren't any good ones. Not one. We talked about what we have in the Catholic Church. The great gifts the fullness of divine revelation. Now, unfortunately, possibly the greatest reason people leave the church is because they don't know what they have. They would never leave if they knew what they had. The full fullness of divine revelation. We in the Catholic Church actually know how to read this book. We have the principles for reading this book properly, the Holy Bible. Now, other denominations study it, and they love it, and I respect them greatly. But, you know, when you, when you, when you do what I do, it's very easy to be impeded by certain things, not the least of which is political correctness. Whether that's ecclesial political correctness or secular political correctness, we are often, we feel impeded. Because, you know, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to say anything hurtful. You shouldn't. Uh, you don't want to upset people. You know, we don't. I'm too old. For fighting. Now, when I was young, Johnny's my name and fighting's my game. But I'm not young anymore. I'm getting old. And I don't like to argue with anybody, and I don't. I refuse to argue with anyone, whether it's a church matters or anything. I just don't argue. I just don't do it. My way or the highway. Very simple theology. I preach from a position of authority. And what I preach is the teaching of the Catholic Church. And I didn't send myself. I've been sent by the one who sends. Now, how do I know that? How can I be certain of that? My superiors told me so. They said, go forth. Do it. And I do. I obey. No arguments. No bickering. No nonsense. What I teach and what I preach is that which the Catholic Church teaches and preaches. Not what some upstart dissident theologian has to say, what the magisterium of the Catholic Church has to say. And when I do that, I have absolute certainty of that which I speak of. You know, a, a lady once said to me, Father, do you know why you convince me in your preaching? I said, no, dear, why do I convince you? She said, you convince me absolutely because you are absolutely convinced. <laughs> and I said, amen, honey. That, that's it. That's right. And that's the truth. Uh, you know, that goes a long way. I, I, I can honestly say before God and before you, I don't have the slightest doubt 
of anything the Catholic Church teaches in faith and moral. If I did, uh, I would be honest with you and say, you know, I have a little, I struggle with this. I, I don't, I'm not sure about this or that or the other thing. I'd be a liar to say that. I'm sure of every bit of it. Everything the church teaches in faith and morals, I believe it. Do I understand it perfectly? No. I've got five university degrees in theology and I earned them with highest honors. And I know what the church teaches, but I'll guarantee you, I don't fully understand everything. I'd have to be God to fully understand God. And, and so I don't, I admit that, but I believe it. Bible doesn't say without understanding it is impossible to please God. Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. And now, you know, we're coming to the end of the day where we have to have the final exam that I talked about. Right? And so if I ask you, what is the theological virtue of faith? I know you're all going to get it. Because you've all studied your catechism. You've all watched my show uh, on Sunday night, uh, uh, every Sunday night for 10 years. So I know you. You know that question. Oh, well, not more than two people in here wouldn't know it. But for the sake of the two, <laughs> faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God. I bet you get that part right. Most people would, I think. But you, you, you see, the church goes on with the definition. That's not enough. People say, oh, I believe in God. And, and what they infer by that is, I believe God exists. Well, the devil believes in the existence of God, and you know where he is. Not good enough. If you really believe in God, what does it mean? Believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, and believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief, because he who has revealed it is truth itself. Now that's the definition of faith, the theological virtue of faith. To believe everything that God has said and revealed to us, to believe all. Now note that it says to believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. The definition doesn't say to believe most of which Holy Church proposes for our belief. It doesn't say to believe some of which Holy Church proposes for our belief. It says we believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. Why? Because it's plausible? No. Because it conforms to my millennial lifestyle? No. Because I like it? No. Because he who has revealed it is truth itself. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. That's God. That's why I believe it, because he has revealed it. So I believe everything, everything, everything the Catholic Church proposes for our belief. Now you may say, I'm too smart for that. You may say, I'm a little too sophisticated for that. You may think you're a little too educated for that. You say, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to accept what sounds good to me. Then you go going by your own ideas, not by faith. And you can't please God that way. You just can't do it. Now, let me interject a little something in the discussion about why people leave the church, why they ought to stay in the church. And we're, we're getting into now the truth. Remember I told you that the truth is the proper object for the intellect. And, and the Catholic Church gives us the fullness of truth because we have the fullness of divine revelation. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition, magisterial teaching. We've got it all. You don't want to be missing any of those parts. If the church teaches me something in faith and morals, I might not quite understand it at first. Now, if the identifying trait in my existence is pride. And when I say that, I, I, I mean that reality expressed by the Greek word hubris. Hubris. That's the self-centered 
egotistical kind of a pride. Now, when you say, I'm proud of my children, or I take pride in my work, that's not what I'm talking about. That's a good thing. It's fine to, to be proud of your family. It's not a bad thing to take pride in your work. You ought to. Do, be all you can be. Do everything you can do. What I'm talking about is that self-centered, egotistical pride which seeks to exalt the creature above the creator. Hubris. Egotistical kind of pride. That's the root of all evil. That is, that is the worst enemy of man. That's how, by the way, that's how death entered the universe. Right? Go back to the garden. God didn't, God didn't create suffering or death. How did that come into being? That came through pride, which issued in disobedience, which is the direct cause of death. That's when pain, suffering, and death entered the created universe. The offset is humility. Now, if I ask you on the exam, in one of the very simple questions, which I would give to you, if I say, and, and with me, you can always get away with a simple answer, as long as it's correct. <laughs> simple is good, I prefer it. You know, you don't have to write five pages. Uh, very simple, short, one sentence if you like. You, you could say, if I said, what is humility? Now, humility is obviously an enormously important thing in Catholic spirituality. Uh, anyone who knows anything about it would, would admit that. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila, great doctor of the church. I went and visited my friends, the Carmelites here uh, in Rochester. They used to be over in Schenectady, New York, and they, they helped me in the beginning of my vocation a great deal. Prayed for me, and I, I didn't know till this morning that they were here in Rochester. So I was just delighted to go over and visit them. I hadn't seen them in about 11 years. Humility, St. Teresa said, is the most important thing there is. Pride is the worst thing there is. Remember what the definition I gave you for pride, that self-centered, egotistical pride that seeks to exalt the creature above the creator, that kind of pride. The greatest thing is humility. Remember, you can remember it this way. No humility, no holiness. No holiness, no heaven. You can write that down and take it to the bank. Uh, uh, and that's the truth. No humility, no holiness, no holiness, no heaven. Prideful arrogance, issues in disobedience, which results in hell. Now, is that simple enough? That pretty straightforward, in-your-face stuff. Absolutely true. Pride, disobedience, death. Humility, obedience, life. St. Teresa said, humility is the acknowledgement of truth. That's the short definition you could give me, and I'd be delighted with it. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. Now, let me expound on that a little bit so, so you have a better idea what it means. It means this. I acknowledge who God is and who I am. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. God is everything. God's the creator. He's all-powerful all-knowing, all-loving, all-merciful. God's everything. Me? I'm a creature. God's the creator. I'm a creature. He's everything. I'm a speck in the cosmos. God loves the speck. That's the punchline. God loves the speck. Now that's humility. Why? That's the acknowledgement of truth. Who God is, who I am. Humility is not going around saying, I'm no good, I'm no good. Well, you may be no good. <laughs> no, you're good. God doesn't create junk. You are good. You are good. So that's false humility. Don't go around saying, oh, I'm no good, I'm the, a useless, wretched thing. Well, that's all good and true. You and I are pretty small. 
in the cosmos. You have gifts, no matter who you are. You have gifts. Now beyond your gifts, your basic humanity is the greatest thing you have. You and I are created in the image and likeness of God. That's the truth. It says so in the Bible. I believe it. That's fundamental Christianity. We are created in the image and likeness of God. Now how great is that? Next time you go around thinking you're no good, or, 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 or you, you can't do anything, remember something. God is your father. Now how great is that? Oh, from when I was a little kid, the devil's been trying to convince me that he would destroy me. And, and he did a real good job for a long time making me believe it. And he still does it. Mama, I'll tell you what. He used to come to St. Teresa, try to scare her. He'd come in the middle of the night, he'd assume all these horrible forms, like monsters and stuff, and be hovering over her bed like a big, the monster that ate Cleveland or something. And she woke up one night and, and she saw the old devil trying to scare her. And she said, oh, it's only you. And she rolled over and went back to sleep. That's how you treat the devil, see. Don't worry about him. Well, he's been trying to tell me and he still does. Oh, yeah, he'll come and visit me periodically, too. I'm going to destroy you. You'll be in hell forever. I don't converse with the devil. You should never do that. But I'm going to tell you this. I just tell him one thing. Take it up with my mama. is my father Mary is my mother who are you pitiful little thing get out of here you are a prince or princess of light God is your father Mary is your mother now how great is that and so don't be afraid of anything don't be intimidated by anything. Don't worry. Like Padre Pio used to say, pray and don't worry. You know, Jesus says, and, and this is in scripture, this is in the gospel. Jesus Christ says, fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Don't forget that. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. That's part of the truth. That's the word of God. Please don't forget that in the days to come because I assure you the days to come will be dark and terrifying at times. But they don't have to be to you. You see, you're special. You are God's child. Your father is God Almighty. And God's perfect. You know how little kids They'll be out playing in the neighborhood, and they'll say, my daddy can whip your daddy. <laughs> my daddy's bigger than yours. Well, God is my father. And whatever I need, he takes care of it. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. I know I can't do anything on my own. That's part of the truth. This, this, is this, this is this humility I'm talking about, all right? The acknowledgement of the truth. The truth is, for me or for you, every one of us, every human being, you and I have gifts. Now, you have different gifts from me, and I may have a different gift from you, but we all have gifts. And it is not humility to deny that truth. You have gifts and I have gifts. And God will do great things through you. I don't care if you're eight or 80. God can do great things through us. But I know that on my own, I know, here's how I know it. From almost 60 years of long, hard experience, I know that I don't amount to a hill of manure on my own.
Left to my own devices, I just can't do it. I can't eat, I can't hardly get out of bed sometimes in the morning, I don't want to. You ought to see what goes on in my house on Thursday night. Now that's the night before I've got to get up and go to the airport to come places like this. I've got three dogs that I live with. They're, they're my immediate family if, in my house. Sage, Delta, and Greta. Two girls and a boy. Thursday night. I can't sleep at all. I haven't slept on a Thursday night for 15 years. Not even a minute. Early in the morning, 3 a.m., the light goes on. Time to get up. Now, I don't believe in spoiling dogs, you know. I'm an old school guy, you know how you keep dogs out in the kennel and everything, and I'm, my dogs are hunting dogs. And so, not spoiling them, of course, as the light goes on. Now, Sage, he's the big old male Chesapeake. He's down at the foot of the bed. <laughs> and, and Delta, she sleeps with her head on the pillow over here. <laughs> and Greta, she's the little German wire-haired pointer. She sleeps on my shoulder here. Light goes on, they all look at each other. <laughs> and they look at me. Oh no, here we go again. He's gonna go, he's going off on a mission. And we're going to dog jail. <laughs> we're going to do penance for the weekend. Man, no pork chops this weekend. Stinking dry dog food be sleeping on concrete. Man, I wish he'd retire. I don't want to do it. I haven't wanted to do it for 20 years. But I always have. Every single time. I don't feel like doing it many a time. But like the Nike commercial says, just do it. And so you just do it. You do your duty. I know I can't do it on my own. The only thing I've ever done, I'll tell you something, when I talk, millions of people listen, and I'm not bragging, I'm just telling the truth. When I talk, millions listen. Why? What do I do? All I do is show up for work. The Holy Spirit does all the rest. I just got to show up for work. And that's all you have to do. Just show up, man. Humility, the acknowledgement of the truth. And what is the truth? You know, you've got to have some perspective on the truth. There is a terrible amount of confusion in the world. Everybody thinks they have the truth. I told you before, the truth is not merely something. The truth is somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, some people don't get that, and, and that's okay. You know, you can tell some people that I don't get excited about that. Oh, I don't believe what you believe, okie dokie. You don't believe what I believe? Fine. What do you believe? Well, I believe the moon is made out of green cheese. Wonderful. Have at it. You know, if that's what... I don't get excited about that. Listen, I learned something a long time ago. I have no control, nor do I want it, over somebody else's mind. I can't make anybody else do anything. Uh, you know, you get upset sometimes. Oh, I don't know why my, my, my grandson, or my daughter, or my nephew, or my husband, or my wife, or my friend, or my co-worker, they just don't get it. They live like pagans and, hey, if God leaves them free, We've got to leave them free too. God does not put out contracts with hitmen to coerce people into loving him. Doesn't work that way. Leave them alone. You know what I do? I'll tell you what I do. People think, oh, you, you must have converted a lot of people, Father. And, and, uh, nope, never. 
in 15 years of constant preaching over a million miles in airplanes, 49 states, over 100 dioceses, never converted anybody. I don't have the power to change a heart or mind. God has the power to change a heart or a mind. I just show up for work and open my mouth and then he does the rest. And you have to come to that understanding, you're not going to convert your children. You're not. And you're not going to convert your wife or your husband. You can't. But God can. What do you have to do? Show up for work. And what does that mean? Be patient and kind and loving and, and be steadfast in the truth. Love your faith. Learn your faith. Live your faith. That's showing up for work. That's what it means to show up for work. There, there were times in the recent history of the church, even today in some places, where it is not in fashion to be faithful to the Catholic Church. Uh, there are many places, even inside the Catholic Church, where taking positions that are staunchly Catholic will get you a rough reception. Could even get you fired from your job. You know, people, people are tr try to say that they are uh, pro-choice in Catholic. Well, I'll give you one. You know, well, I'm a good Catholic. You know, I, I, I've heard some so-called Catholic politicians say this one. Long as we're talking about the truth, might as well talk about it. Oh, well, I'm a good Catholic. I'm Catholic, but I'm pro-choice. Happy horse manure. Ain't no such thing. You can't be pro-choice and Catholic. Period. You can't. That's impossible. Can't do it. Forget that. Man, wake up and smell the roses. You're, gonna, you, you, you're telling me you, you can uh, condone killing the most innocent in what should be the safest place in the universe for them, their own mother's womb? You're saying you can condone that, support that, promote that, and be a good Catholic? You are out of your mind if you think that. That is totally inconsistent with Catholicism or Christianity of any authentic kind. And the politicians who call themselves Catholic and yet vote every time for abortion, partial birth, abortion, etc., are they Catholic? No. They can talk till they're blue in the face. What they are is excommunicated. That's what they are. But I get nobody seems to have the guts to say it. They are excommunicated in virtue of their own act. A latte sententiae excommunication. Now, a woman who knowingly and willingly procures an effective abortion, if she is aware of the canonical penalty, she incurs excommunication. Are we to believe? that the politicians who foster millions of such crimes against humanity are free morally? Absolutely not. The poor woman may be scared, upset, maybe she doesn't have knowledge, maybe she has no support. I, I'm not against her, I sympathize with her and think everything should be done to help her. I'll, do, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. But I won't give the benefit of the doubt to the so-called Catholic politician who do everything in their power to effect the demise of the most innocent of human beings. And they are human beings. No, they're, they're, not, they're not potential human beings. They are human beings with potential. And that is an essential distinction that you have to make from the moment of conception. That's part of the truth. Oh, don't get that one wrong. You get that one wrong, it's a slippery slope right into hell, in plain English. Human life begins at conception and is sacred right to the last moments 
of natural life. I got a letter last week from a group of nuns who were writing a living will, a living trust, and they asked me for some information on uh, life issues, end of life issues, um, and they were confused. They had been told by various theologians and so forth that under certain circumstances it's, it's, all, right, it's all right to withhold water, hydration, and food. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And of course, everybody knows about the Terry Schiavo case. Read my lips. Terry Schiavo wasn't sick. They killed her in a most inhumane fashion, period. Using the same logic they used as they were killing her on this side of the world, a man was dying on the other side of the world. And using their logic, they should have shut off nutrition and hydration to him. And his name was Pope John Paul II. You can't do it. You do not have to provide extraordinary means when the end has come. A bunch of machines and so forth. But you always have to provide nutrition and hydration. You can't kill a human being. Oh, but the human being's so sick. So you, that's not a, you're, it's like an animal, you're going to put him out of his misery? It sounds good, but it's sick. It is morally depraved. Now, I know it's hard to look at it. Believe you me, I've looked at it more times than most people have as a priest. I've seen it, and I know it's awful difficult to look at human suffering like that, and I sympathize with it. But never allow... You know, it's good to be soft-hearted. Good to be soft-hearted. But don't become soft-headed. You know, you got the difference? I mean, soft-hearted, yes. Be compassionate. Empathize with the, the struggles and suffering of other people. But don't let that make you soft-headed. You know, oh, I, I want to end the suffering, you know. Well, you might as well put a bullet in their head then. That's what you're doing. Can't do it. Period. I'll tell you what, you know. A uh, lady said to me the other day, well, I, I don't want to, when I get old, I don't want my children to do anything for me. I want to just let them, you know, let me die. Okay, you know, but that, that's fine. But, but you can't commit suicide, you know. All right, you, you pray for strength from God and he'll give it to you. But, you know, in the meantime, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed you, even, even with a tube if I have to, to, to keep you going and give you water. You've got to at least have hydration. You know, that's a terribly painful way to die. That's like torture to systematically withhold nutrition and hydration. That's part of the truth. That's part of the truth. We have to accept that. Now, the truth is not something we make up as we go along. The truth is what it is. It's objective and absolute. And I'll tell you where it goes back to. When God was, spoke to Moses on the mountain, and he revealed his name to Moses, you remember? He said, I am who am. Go tell the Israelite people, I am sent you. What that means is, God's very essence is existence. God is life itself. God is uncreated being. Uh, everything else is, is created being. There's, there's two classes of, of being, uncreated and created. There's the creature, God, or the creator, God, and the creature, us, animals, plants, and so forth. Okay? There's God and everything else that God created. That's reality. That's objective in character. Something went very wrong in about the 17th century. Uh, before that, philosophy was pretty much common sense and, and solid. But then it went off with a philosopher named Rene Descartes. You know, before that, philosophy, especially um, ontology and epistemology, it started with the, the truth of things in themselves. Now, I'll give you an example. It's, this is simple. Don't, don't ever 
get intimidated or put off because you think, well, I can't understand this. Believe me, the most profound things in the universe are simple. God, by definition, is pure simplicity, as St. Thomas Aquinas said, but not to us. We, we complicate a simple thing. God in himself is ultimate simplicity, but we, we complicate the matter. Now, an example. See, this, this is a Bible. Okay, it says right there, Holy Bible. This is the Word of God, Scripture, Holy Bible. Descartes would say, well, that's a Bible because you think it is. He reversed all of previous philosophy with his famous cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Just the opposite. Why is this a Bible? It's a Bible because it's a Bible. It is what it is what it is. This is a Bible because it's a Bible, not just because I think so. If I think this is a pepperoni pizza, does it then become a pepperoni pizza? Heck no, it's still a Bible. What's wrong? Something wrong with me. The truth of things, that's where it begins. It is what it is. Jesus Christ is objective and absolute, the Son of the only Father. The only word our Heavenly Father ever spoke in the eternal silences of the Trinity. But if you take millions of people and say, who's Jesus Christ? They'll all have different ideas. One will say this thing. One will say that thing. Remember what happened in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew? They were in the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus said to the disciples, he said, well, who do men say that I am? The first Gallup poll. <laughs> Who do men say that I am? And then the responses came. Well, 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 well some say, you're Elijah. Um, some say, Jeremiah. Some say, this prophet, or one of the other prophets. You ask, he asked a question, simple question, who they say I am? And you got conflicting and contradictory responses. And they can't all be right. And then he, he turned, he narrowed his gaze on his apostles and he said, yes, but who do you say that I am? And I can imagine an eerie silence. And then one voice rang out with all the authenticity and authority of truth. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. Ah, Simon, son of John, no mere man has revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I, for my part, declare that you are rock, and upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So you see, the truth isn't a subjective construct. In other words, the truth isn't something that we as individuals make up as we go along. The truth is what it is what it is. Whether you like it or not or believe it or not, it is what it is. And our job is to accept it, to accept the truth. In the Catholic Church, we're very fortunate. The Church gives us the fullness of that truth through that three means of divine revelation, scripture, tradition, magisterial teaching. There is no need for any Catholic to be confused about basic teaching in faith and moral. You don't have to be confused about whether or not abortion is right or wrong under this circumstance or that. You know the answer. It's been given to us. What's our job? Accept it. You may say, I don't understand it, though. You don't have to. We walk by faith, not by sight. You have to accept it. Now, can you then study, inquire, pursue knowledge of that which you accept by faith? Sure, absolutely. You should do that. I highly encourage that. Learn your faith. Learn your Catholic faith. Ten years ago, I knew 
I had to do a major work on the newly issued Catechism of the Catholic Church. Ten years ago, I knew that this was a monumental undertaking. This was a gift of unprecedented proportions that God gave to us through his church. I was lucky, it was divine providence, not luck. From the very beginning, I, I worked with the catechism. When I was doing my pre-ordination retreat uh, for my diaconal ordination, I was at a monastery in Petersham, Massachusetts, and uh, Cardinal O'Connor's uh, priest, um, head of religious education in the Archdiocese of New York, happened to be on retreat there. And he had the first draft of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And he gave me a copy and he said, and he, he gave me a copy uh, of that and a red pen. And he said, I want you to go through, read every word of it, I want you to make notes. Tell me what you think is strong and tell me what you think is weak. And so I got to read it from the very first draft. And then I went to Spain to study and I was at a university that had a doctoral program in catechesis. And I was able to see every succeeding draft. And I worked with it long before it ever came out in English. And then when it came out in English, I knew I had to do this. And so I, I took a whole year of my life. And in a big auditorium like this, the Sacramento Convention Center in Sacramento, California, with the local affiliate of ABC Television videotaping everything and audiotaping everything, we put that all on tape. The Teaching of Jesus Christ, a 48-part series, which is now after digitally remastering it and so forth, it's, it's 50 parts on DVD. The entire Catechism of the Catholic Church, that is what the Catholic Church teaches. If you study that, if you read that, if you interiorize that, you will know your faith. You have my personal guarantee on that before Almighty God. I guarantee you before God our Father that if you do that, you will know your faith in some cases better than some priests today know the faith. Uh, and, uh, but don't, but don't, don't let it go to your head. <laughs> it ain't rocket science, folks. The truth. It is what it is what it is. Learn that catechism of the Catholic Church. Then you'll come to understand the Bible. You'll know how to read it better as the church reads it. You'll be able to answer questions because you'll learn, you learn principles. If you learn a principle, you can answer thousands of questions. It's like the old axiom, if you give a man a fish, he can feed himself for a day. If you teach the man how to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. And that's the way it is with learning your faith. You learn it, take the time to learn it, then you have the principle for dealing with life. You, 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 can, you can answer so many questions and people will come to you with their questions. And so, learn your Catholic faith. Now, you may say, I'm too old. No, you're not. But I'm 80, not too old. Well, I'm too young. I'm only eight. You're not too young. Whether you're eight or 80, whatever age you are, you can do better. Learn your faith. You should, if you love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, you ought to want to know something about him. You see, to study your faith is to study Jesus, because he's the truth. Do it. Do it, and I promise you, You'll not be disappointed. You see, you can't outdo God in generosity. You give him a little bit of your time, and he will give you an eternity of happiness. God bless you.